May your presence fill up my heart as I choose to chase after you. Bring a deeper revelation in the wisdom found in your truth encountering the power of your love. Encountering the power of your love. Let's sing the verse again. May your presence fill up my heart as I choose to chase after you. Bring a deeper revelation and the wisdom found in your truth and down the ring the power of your love. Say, I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, my Lord. I worship you. I worship you. Worship you, my Lord. I lift you up. I lift you up. I lift you up, my Lord. I lift you up. I lift you up. Lift you up, my Lord. I honor you. I honor you. Honor you, my Lord. Tell them today. 
every turn I come face to face with you Oh yeah Like a tidal wave Crashing over me Rushing in to meet me here Your love is fierce Like a hurricane I can't escape Your love is fear, your love is fear, your love is fear, your love is fear. Oh. Chase me down, seek me out. How could I be lost when you have caught me? Found, yeah. You chase me down, you seek me out. How could I be lost when you have caught me? Found, oh, you chase me down, you seek me out. How could I be lost? Like a tide wave crashing over me, rushing in to meet me here. Your love is fear, like a hurricane that I can't escape. Shut yourself in this morning. Put your focus on it. Jesus. Just say his name. 
Jesus, yeah. Jesus, I receive your love. receive your love say his name Jesus 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 I receive your love put your hands up and worship him say Jesus oh my Jesus Jesus Just bask in his presence. So good, so good, you're so good, you're so good, Jesus, you're so good, you're so good to me. Declare it. You're so good, you're so good, Lord, you're so good, you're so good, Lord, you're so good. So good to me, yeah. And you're so good, you're so good, you're so good, yeah. You're so good, Jesus, you're so good, you're so good to me. Tell them from your heart today. Oh, you're so good, you're so good, yeah. You're so good, yeah. You're so good. Oh, you're so good. So good, so good, Lord. You're so good, you're so good, you're so good, you're so good to me. Oh, your love takes me over. Yes, your love takes me over. Oh, your love takes me over, Jesus. takes me over oh your love takes me over your love takes me over Jesus and this is my desire to honor you Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, I worship you, yes, with all I have within me, I give Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, and I live for you alone, every breath that I take. 
says my desire to all Praise the Lord of glory. We worship you, Father. We love you. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for who you are, who you are to us and through us, Lord. We adore you, Jesus. We thank you, Father God, that you're good even when we're not. We thank you for the blood of Jesus, Lord. We thank you that our faith is in you, Father God. You are the one. You. This is he that came by water and blood. 
And Lord, it's the Spirit that bears witness, for the Spirit is truth, Father God. And the Spirit bears witness to who He is, and that's who we are in Him, regardless of our performance, good or bad. Father God, we thank you that it's all about Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all about Jesus. So stop making it about you. Let's try that again. Say, it's all about Jesus. So stop making it about you. Isn't that good news? Praise God. We worship you, Lord. We adore you. We love you. We magnify you. You're so good. Glory to God. Jesus is the goodness of God. I'm just overwhelmed at the goodness of God. You know, so often we we get into a rut where we're thinking about ourselves like all the time. I'm telling you, it's about Him. It's good news. Well, how do you know God loves you? (laughs) He that spared uh, spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not also with Him freely give us all things? Jesus is what makes, is the one who makes the gospel the good news. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord of glory. (laughs) Hallelujah. Have a seat here if you want. I don't care. Stand on your head. (laughs) John, stand on your head. Let's see if you can do it. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Erica, we're going to have some announcements and we're going to get into the word of God. Oh, yes. You have to remind me. July 9th? July 9th. July 9th. Yes. See, Ed. Wave your hands, Ed. Stand up. Do a dance. (laughs) Throw money his direction. (laughs) No. No. July 9th. And who is the artist? Is Noah Noah Back. Okay. Do we have anything out in the... Okay, we don't have a flyer yet, but see, Ed. Did you? Okay. Okay, so he has tickets today if anybody wants them, July 9th, see, Ed. Okay. Oh, Walt already hit you. <laughs> okay, why don't we take just a moment and say hello to one another? Hug, shake, high five. Dance like Ed. Okay, we're going to find our seats because we can do this after church today. If you brought your lunch, we can either go outside or we can go in the basement. I know thunderstorms are maybe come our direction. But if you didn't bring a lunch, go run to McDonald's or somewhere real quick and come back. It's an easy, easy solution. But we are going to fellowship after church today, so that's exciting, everyone. Yes? Um, let's see. Kristen, sit down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we, we thank you, you guys, to the Pete Mercer Band. I'm just kidding. To our worship band. And 
Friday, July 1st, he, they are going to open for Jeremy Camp at BMI. So if you do not have your tickets, please go get those. It'll be a great, great night. And Michael, I love to hear you sing. That was great. That was great. Um, Except for the bass player. I know. I was up there and I put them headphones on, which I got it all tangled up for you guys. <laughs> but uh, uh, Michael's voice was like, I thought, man, are my ears bleeding? <laughs> <laughs> And we don't want to forget about Relationship University at 9 a.m. in the mornings here. We were still discussing the character traits of healthy relationships, and I'm telling you, it was good. So you don't have to be to every class, even if you've never been, just jump right in. It's very, very, very good. Um, and I asked the question this morning because I, I don't want to fail to mention it. I ask the question, like, like every Sunday, what's the goodness of God testimony that you've had this week? And nobody said it, but I want someone to mention it. What happened this week? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. You guys realize how big a miracle that is? That is a miracle. And the devil is melting down. And I'm telling you, it's satanic. It's demonic. What, it, what is coming against this. I mean, who, how can't you celebrate life? But that's the truth. I love what Lucas Miles says. Lucas said this. I thought it was so good. He said, if you are going to a church where they're not excited about what happened Friday, it's time to find another church. Praise God. Praise God. I keep looking at you, Tatiana, and I, just, I have something. God just put it on me. I'm, I'm going to say it. God put a song in your heart, and you're the only one who can sing it. Okay? That's for you. All right. So glad to have her here. So, um, ladies meeting. Ladies meeting tomorrow night here at 630. All ladies, welcome. It's a great, great time in the Word. We are studying the Holy Spirit, so meet here at 6.30 tomorrow night. Um, baptisms, if you've never been baptized, who here has never been baptized that would like to be? Water baptized, yes. No? Okay, well. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um. Well, if you've never been baptized or if you have a friend or a family member that chooses, that has a desire to do that, or, we are going to have that in August coming up. We're going to meet fellowship at Michael and I's home, and then we'll walk down the street to Tiffany and Ryan Beckstead, which I don't think they're here today, but they've offered their swimming pool for anyone who would choose to be baptized. So that's coming up sometime in August for a date to be determined, but that's an, another great opportunity to fellowship and get to know one another and just hang out because we're a family and we need to start acting like it, right? Okay, so Thursday prayer meeting, 6 p.m. here on Thursdays. I'm hearing it now. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, Celebrate Recovery, always here on Friday night at 6 p.m. Yes. So, and I think that's it. So, everybody, I know Chris mentioned it about what Lucas Miles said, but now's the time. Now's the time for Christians to stand up and do something. Not just celebrate, okay, this is a great victory. It took the stain off of nations. The fight is still on, but there's much to do. Be available. Help children. Help single moms. Do whatever the Lord lays on your heart to do, but do something. Okay. Thank you, Erica. Praise God. Sarah? Okay. I am super excited. The kids, we had four teenagers go to church camp this past week. And when I went to pick them up Friday, they had an amazing time, not just fun, but they experienced God in brand new ways that like, I kept crying like happy tears. Like it was just so cool hearing their stories. And um, I've just been feeling so excited because I've really been trying to pray in the spirit more. I've been asking the Holy Spirit to remind me like, 
I'm a mober, a mom Uber. <laughs> I drive like all the time everywhere. And so I've been asking Holy Spirit to remind me to pray in the Spirit while I'm driving. So I've been doing that. And I've been seeing personal, three different personal miracles in my own life that honestly, it felt at times hopeless. And like, I just couldn't see how this was going to happen, but I had to keep taking it to the Lord anyway. And I've been praying in the Spirit over the kids. And just anyway, so there have been some amazing things happening. And we have two teens that <laughs> they were nervous, but they agreed that they would be willing to come up and share just briefly um, some things that really ministered to their heart and that was cool about camp this week. So if Alaya and Caleb, did Caleb disappear on me? Or where, oh, no, there he is. Okay. <laughs> I was like, go get him out of the bathroom. Um, Alaya and Caleb, come on up. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you <laughs> to everyone who donated, uh, hired them, allowed them to work to raise funds. That just took a lot of this pressure off of the finances. So who wants to go first? Did it open up? Okay. <laughs> just, I just got filled with the Holy Spirit at um, church camp. And, yeah. Um. Before I went, if you would have told me that I was getting up and speaking in front of a, a 400 teenage kids and that I would get a word for them and I'd have to go up and get the mic and speak in front of all of them, I would have thought you were crazy. I'll be honest. But I did that twice. And through that, I had multiple people come up to me and tell me how what I said meant so much to them and how it was just, it was just really, really cool to see how I was able to work through how God was able to work through me for other people. And Aliyah had so many cool experiences. And just, I wanted to share briefly, this actually didn't happen to Aliyah, but it was, and it's just very quick. Um, so Aliyah's, I don't know, a friend or roommate, um, but there was like a group of them that decided on their free time. You don't get a whole lot of free time at camp. So when you do get free time, I just remember I wanted to go like sleep. <laughs> I was exhausted. But there were a group, and you said close to 15 kids, okay, that decided instead of just going to sleep or whatever, they wanted to have a prayer meeting. <laughs> and I'm like, that's when you know their hearts are, they're feeling God. Like, there's no better feeling than God, his presence. And um, so anyway, she said that while they were praying, her friend, um, I don't know if I've shared with you later or whatever, but the Lord had started putting on her heart something about um, declaring and like taking the, the sign of the rainbow back in the name of Jesus and declaring that like instead of our pride is not in shameful, icky things that are not of God, our pride is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was cool because I guess Brayden was in a different part of the camp during free time. And somehow they connected and he showed him this cool picture, which Melanie put this up and you can't see it very well there. We're going to zoom in in just a second. I've never, I'm 38 years old. I, I mean, this is, I guess it can happen. It's just rare, but I just think the timing of it's cool. Um, but Brayden came and was it showed Alaya, I guess, or, or showed somebody the cool cloud he saw, it was a cloud, just the cloud, and it had rainbow colors just in the cloud. And um, go ahead and zoom in on that next part. I, I don't know, I'm hoping. I do have it on my phone if you guys want to see it. Um, but the next one is a close-up. But it was just super cool that right at the same time that that girl had been feeling on her heart about praying and declaring about the rainbow, God's promise, and then they see just a cloud with a rainbow. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was super cool. If we can't get it, just come up to me and I can show you on my phone or whatever. That's okay. Um, and it just reminded me, like, because something personally that happened in my life maybe about two weeks ago as I've been praying in the Spirit. Can you guys see that? Isn't that cool? Have you guys seen that before? <laughs> I've just never seen that in my entire life. I, you know, just a regular rainbow is what I always see. Anyway, but I was just, my mind is like, you know, you're believing and you're expecting God to do cool stuff. But then when it still happens, it's still amazing and I was watching something before my eyes happened like that I couldn't do and I tried to do and get it done and there was the vision and and not just in my personal some stuff personally going like with kiddos and whatever um 
And it was just so amazing. Like, I was watching it before my eyes, God, dissolve in three different instances. Um, but one in particular in my own, blending families is tough. And um, just some cool stuff happening. And I was like, Lord, there were three things that happened in one weekend that I'd been struggling with for a long time. <clears throat> and I just felt like it was never going to happen or whatever. And then I was like, Lord, did all this, all this just happen because I've been praying in the spirit a little bit more? Like, man, I got to up my game. <laughs> and so <clears throat> it's just been amazing. And then, um, sorry, I got so many thoughts going through my head. But the right, you know, the, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I feel like we need, it's like I didn't even think. I don't know why, but to take authority over the homosexual agenda in our country. Like, we got to do that, you know? Like, take our, each, each individual believer is, um, we're powerful, and Satan doesn't want us to know that. And so we have to take our authority over that. And just, and how one person even can cause things to change. So I just want to encourage you guys, pray in the spirit, and thank you so much for what you're doing for our kiddos. Awesome. You know, that's why the devil fights praying in the Spirit so hard. I guarantee you, he wants your Christianity to be limited to your peanut brain. I'm telling you, that's why he, he fights it tooth and nail. Give me 1 Corinthians 14, too. This isn't the message, but before we go, I just meditate on this. Because let me tell you something about praying. When you're praying in the Spirit, which is praying in private tongues, well, let me tell you, your mind uh, sometimes will fight. There's no feeling sometimes, none. That's why you need to hear me say this a lot. I remember taking my Bible one time and sitting it on the floor and I, and, and I, because I wasn't feeling anything. You ever had that? Where you're feeling and sometimes things are attacking you, oppression and those kind of things. And I remember taking my Bible, if I could get 1 Corinthians 14 too, I'll quote it if not, that's okay. Okay, but 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 2 says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but unto God, for no man understands him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. And that word mysteries is that which is outside the range of natural human apprehension. You're speaking the mind of Christ. And I can show you that in other verses too. Satan hates that. See, God's got a perfect plan for your life. But so does the devil has a wicked plan for your life. And, and the, the Lord wants to, just like I shared that with you last week from that David Martin from England. You know, God wants you to be able to pray outside of what you know. Which isn't very much. No offense. It's not. But the Bible says you're speaking those mysteries, and Satan hates it. He hates it. That's why people get so upset about it. You know why you get so upset about it? It's demonic. I didn't say you were demonized. I said the demons are, you're listening to lies. Read the Bible. This isn't my opinion. I'm saying this out of love for you. You think you can turn the Holy Spirit on and off? No, he's always on. I'm the one who's on and off. It's powerful, guys. But see, a lot of it takes pure faith or you'll stop praying. Because sometimes there's no feelings at all. And then sometimes there's explosion of feelings. But you can't base it on it. You've got to base it on the Word of God. Heather, you had something. Good morning. Oh, come on, you guys. You have to be asleep. Come on. Good morning. Thank you. All right. So um, today I'm up here just because uh, it's basically a small advertisement for Celebrate Recovery. Now, I know what a lot of people think about Celebrate Recovery sometimes because it's just something that we always go to. It's only for addictions. Well, I'm going to start, I'm going to do something a little different this morning. And this different is I'm going to kind of walk you through how we go about doing things in Celebrate Recovery. And one of the things here, real quick, is a self-intro. So I'm going to do that Celebrate Recovery stuff intro, and I will say, this is something that's very personal to me. So keep an open mind. I know it's not going to be easy, what I'm about to say. But, hi, my name's Heather. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with depression, anxiety, self-worth, doubting, anger, strife. The list goes on and on, but I will tell you, I have a victory through Jesus Christ over transgenderism and lesbianism. There you go. There you go. 
All right, so real quick, if, um, if I can, can I get the lights to be turned down just, to, just for a moment? Uh, while they're turning the lights down, um, there's something that we have it's in our small groups, and we have guidelines. And uh, number four guideline, the first sentence is, anonymity and confidentiality are basic requirements. So with this basic requirement, I'm going to ask you guys a question. But I'm going to ask you to do me a favor first. What I need you to do is close your eyes. Everyone in this room, I need you to close your eyes right now. Please, thank you. And I'm going to say, make sure that when I ask you this question and you raise your hands as the things that I list, that you are honest with yourself. Step out of denial just for a moment and be honest with yourself. If you're not honest with God, or if you're not honest with yourself, how could you ever be honest with God? So this is the question I will ask. Is everyone's hands clo or eyes closed? Raise your hand. Everyone's eyes are closed. I say this because we are doing this out of confidentiality and anonymity. All right? My question is, what are you struggling with? Raise your hand for the following. Are you struggling with anxiety today? Okay, you can put your hand down. Are you struggling with PTSD? Are you struggling with depression? Are you struggling with anger? Doubting. Do you struggle with doubting God? <clears throat> Listening to authority. Anger and strife, because anger, if you hold on to it, it becomes strife. Do you deal with overeating? Codependency. And here's that word again, pride. Who here deals with pride? Sex, or the effects of sexual abuse. Trauma. Who here has dealt with a trauma in their life? Doesn't matter how old you are. <clears throat> I, your identity. You struggle with who you are. Who am I? Your self-worth. Self-esteem. Be brutally honest with you guys. Be brutally honest with yourself. Selfishness. Trust. Who has difficulty trusting? And the last one, I, it's difficult, but who here struggles with denial? Okay, you guys can put your hands down. Thank you. All right, you can uh, bring the lights back up if you like. So real quick, I'm going to go through this. My hands are shaking like crazy. I'm just be totally honest with you. Um, I'm putting this up here because... I won't be able to read. So now, how many of you ask these questions? We all ask these questions. It says, what is my problem? How many of you guys ask yourselves, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? Why do I keep doing these things? The next question we ask ourselves is, how do I handle or get past this? How do I deal with this? I don't know what I'm doing. And why do I handle it? Why do I need to handle it in the ways that I'm handling it? Or in the first place, why am I dealing with this in the first place? So, now how do we handle or deal with our issues, right? Like, how do we deal with it? I'm going to go through this real quick as fast as I can, Pastor Pierce, I do apologize. This is, the how to handle or deal with said problem is mapped out in the serenity prayer through Matthew 6, 25 through 34. While the serenity prayer is not in Scripture, I know, it's not in Scripture. It is heavily, however, it is heavily influenced by Scripture. It's heavily influenced. Um, if you want, you can put this up there. You don't have to. It says, first, let's look at Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Matthew uh, 6, uh, 25 starts out, is, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Are you not worth more than that? Look at the birds of the air. He's telling you, it's an instruction, look, look. This is a tangible thing. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your hot heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Worry he does nothing but take away from our lives. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies in the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his 
glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, it is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what we will drink or what we will wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly, eagerly seek all these things for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. It's the instruction, right? It says, so do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Now, let's look at the serenity prayer real quick. Real quick. The serenity prayer. God, and if you guys know it, say it along with me. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting a hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. To accept his peace and gain what we call serenity, we must be able to understand that through obtaining wisdom. We let go and live one moment at a time and one day at a time. We give up our power to try to control our situation and our circumstances. Also, in giving up the sense of control, we then open ourselves up to trust and rely on or in him and not in or on ourselves. And when we are able to do this, our lives then are able to be free from our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, including our worries. Also, in Matthew 6.33, it clearly gives what we should do first, the instruction to seek him and his righteousness, not our own. And then all things that we ask for would be added, not the contrary. <clears throat> In today's society, they tell us that it is the contrary. But if we continue on the contrary to Scripture, we are operating out of pride. We then lead ourselves into a pit, much like the blind leading the blind. So, <laughs> no, I guess, I know, I, I can guess what you guys are thinking. How in the world does Celebrate Recovery help me with this? Celebrate Recovery is a tool a tangible tool to get freedom from life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. It's not just for addictions. It's for literally everything, including what each and every one of you just raised your hands for. It's for those things. I've had PTSD my entire life, and God is starting to free me from that. So it's not just for addictions or these, all those people. Right? So, I urge all of us to utilize this amazing tool, what God has given us, even myself. I'm not only saying this to you, I'm looking at myself in the mirror right now. That's one reason why I'm shaking. So remember, with the help of God and through the tool of Celebrate Recovery, you can be free. Who wants to be free? I know I do. We aren't meant to do it alone. In fact, in Genesis 2.18, it even states, it is not good for man to be alone. So why on earth, if we are not meant to be alone, why on earth are we trying to go through our hurts, habits, and hang-ups alone? I mean, seriously, what have you got to lose? What do you have to lose? Well, besides your struggles. Thank you. That's 6 p.m. 6 p.m. every Friday. Celebrate recovery. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Celebrate recovery. 6 p.m. every Friday. Um, like I said, it's not just for, it's for anything. I want to receive the offering now. What a blessing. What a blessing. We say it all the time. You don't have to give. You get to give. Amen. It's a privilege and an honor to give. You know, what if we looked at everything that God told us to do as, a, as an opportunity to draw on his grace instead of some legalistic command. Because that's what it is. You know, there's scriptures in <laughs> that we ignore. You know why we ignore them? Because we don't understand them. 
But it says, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous, 1 John 5. I believe that's verse 3. We're going there. Just give me time. We're going there. It's not talking about keeping the Mosaic law. That's not what it's talking about. It's the love of God. What does that look like? Those are in there for our, our benefit. Say this with me. Say, everything in the Bible is written for me to understand and to change my life. Amen. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. All right. So whenever you're ready, say, hold up your offering and say, I give, not grudgingly or of constraint. God loves a cheerful giver. And Lord, I am blessed. I'm not giving to be blessed. This is an offering of gratitude. I am grateful. And I believe being for increase. Say it. Come on, let's say it. I'm believing for increase. God is a God of increase. So we can expand the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. You're blessed and whenever you're ready. I'm falling, helpless, be in love. In you, Jesus, I am falling, completely in love. And I'm excited about the Word of God. Um, I guess the, what class is staying up going down? Kids are staying up. Awesome. This will um, be good for you. Really good for you. Um, hold on here. Getting... The teens are staying up. The teens are staying up. The other kids are going down. Is that right? Did I get it right? All right. Praise the Lord. Who's got your outline? I'm watching the time. I do watch the time, and then I forget about it. <laughs> All right. God is good. But the Word of God is so good. And there's so many things that, you know, even as I look at this outline, I, there's some uh, expanded uh, passages of Scripture that I, that I thought, well, I'll just hit the, the short end of it. But I really believe God wants me to, to do it all. And the, and the reason is because we need to go into the mind of Scripture. I got something here I'm going to read to you before I start. This is uh, from a book by a guy named Doug Stringer, and it's called Born to Die, and it's about Jesus. Uh, uh, I imagine that. But it's Born to Die, and, and it's a study in Leviticus. Probably your favorite book. I, I realize that. But you know, when you see Jesus, the whole Bible comes alive. And I want you to know, I have been having a blast in the Old Testament. Just an absolute blast. I just want to read this to you. Um, it says, this is the introduction. It says, God is real. God is real. It was 1993, and Bob had been coming to our Friday night worship services where I had been teaching an eight-week series on the work of the cross. I had just completed the final message in this series entitled Mission Accomplished. Bob had come come. 
uh, to us as a skeptic. But now, with tears in his eyes, he came down the aisle. He came to the cross knowing the God of the Bible is as real today as he was to the Levitical priest. Many years later, Bob is still an integral part of our ministry. He has impacted hundreds of thousands through the Jesus in the Steps ministry he founded along with his ministry to AIDS patients. Who would have imagined? Here we go. Who would have imagined? Who would have imagined that a study on the book of Leviticus could so profoundly change a man's life? A, one, a wrecker truck driver who for 19 years had been a hardcore heroin meth addict. But that is the beauty of the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. It never goes forth void. Isn't that amazing? See, I think that's so powerful. And, 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 uh, but that's how the word of God is. I, I told you the story one time. I was talking to this guy on the phone. And I was, I was telling him something that I had seen uh, uh, in uh, Leviticus, the first five chapters, we were just talking in conversation. I thought he was tracking with me and about the, the, the three offerings that were volunteer, the burnt offering, the meal offering, and the peace offering are listed ahead of the two offerings that are mandatory, the sin offering and the, and the trespass offering. And as I was talking to him, uh, you know, it always, why wouldn't the mandatory offerings be first? I'm thinking this, but I believe I have the answer because it actually, it points to Jesus who voluntarily gave his life. And uh, there's, there's a ton we could say about that. Well, anyhow, I'm talking to this guy on the phone and I, I made that comment and we were just conversing about it. He said, well, you know, that's okay for preachers and stuff, but it really doesn't have any relevance to just plain people or whatever. And I thought, that is a lie from hell. All of the scriptures are necessary and good for you and I. And they all point to Jesus. And the more you see Jesus, the more it changes your life. Can I have John 16? <sighs> 26 and 27. Yesterday I was, had the privilege of going on um, a little RUN, which I don't do much, but I get these m moods, I guess, and, and, since it, and I don't like heat, and so, but I like that good sweat. Don't ask me why. And so I go out and I go run three miles, and, and I just, all I did was lock in on two verses uh, in my meditation. And I was thinking about these verses the whole way, and, and if, I'll, I'll get them if you don't have them. I got my hard copy here. John 16, 27 and 28, I think is what it is. And, and they're just so powerful. And look at, look at John 16 and look at verse, hmm, no, 26 and 27. That's what I want to I do. 26 and 27. Jesus speaking, he said, At that day ye shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray or request the Father for, him, for you. Listen to this. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's not a big deal, Chris. I meditated on those verses before, but when it says the Father, it's, Jesus is saying, you're not, you know, you're not going to have to have me do it. You can go directly to the Father now in my name because you're on, I've put you in me. You're in me and I'm in you. We're one. I was praying recently, and, and, I, and I just hit I said, well, you, you know, I was just thinking about Jesus is the son, and I am a son, and the son, and that's all true. I'm not minimizing that, but I was making it like there's Jesus, and there's me, and the Lord spoke to me. and said, you got that wrong. He said, you got to stop seeing yourself separate from me. See, that sounds like heresy to religion. But in your born-again spirit, you are one. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. See, that's our problem. That's our problem. We're, Wait up, Jesus. I'm following you. Boy. Hey, you'll get left. Listen, you're in him if you're born again. He's in you. Let, read Jesus' priest, high priestly prayer. Go to John 17. Not, you don't have to now. But just take John 17 and read verses 20 all the way to 26, the end of the chapter. And then, at, then ask yourself the question, did Jesus get his prayers answered, yes or no? And he prayed that, w that we would be one. Are you born again? Let me see your hands. See, the problem is we identify separate with who he is. You're not Jesus. I'm not saying that. But I am saying if you're born again, you are a partaker of his divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. And you've got to stop identifying separate from him. See, it's so subtle sometimes you don't even realize it. And it says, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believe that I came out from God. Now watch this. The Greek word used twice there for love is not agape. 
It's phileo. It's friendship love. You know what it is? It, it means to have an emotional attachment because of an intimate and prolonged association. The father himself has an emotional attachment to you because of an intimate and prolonged association that you have with me. Jesus is saying that. See, it's all about Jesus. That's why it's good news. But see, you can't get that because we, if you don't focus on the things of God, you will automatically revert back to thinking like the world. Or you'll never leave that. See, that's why it's called a good fight of faith, right? It's a good fight because it's already won, but you've got to fight to believe that you're one with him in the spirit. That's a fight. Because you look in the mirror and think, yeah, right. And like Heather was saying, you struggle with this, you struggle with that, right. You know, don't get me wrong. I the serenity prayer, but I'm telling you, you don't have to be reasonably happy here. You can be overjoyed. You can rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory as you behold him. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. And you don't have to wait till you exit this body and go to heaven. It doesn't matter what's going on. That's who we are in Christ. Glory to God. <laughs> get excited. Hallelujah. All right, let's get it. This is the four ingredients. The four powerful ingredients to Christian growth. This is part five. There could actually, uh, there's, there's four powerful ingredients. There could actually be another one. But I'm going to use the other one to kind of encompass this all. This one is, talk, talk, is entitled, the subtitles, Being Faithfully Teachable. None of these things work unless you are faithful to stick with it. Amen? Most men, Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, will proclaim their own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Now, faithfulness isn't about your effort. Faithfulness involves feeding on his faithfulness. Psalm 37, verse 3, the new King James says, feed on his faithfulness. That's what causes us to be faithful. Well, let's look at these and let's review. Um, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about my Christian life. And as I said before, we could be here all day talking about things I haven't done right or things I've done wrong and mistakes and all that kind of stuff. And that's where the enemy wants you to focus. You know, if your heart condemns you not, then have you confidence with God? 1 John 3, 21. You know what it means to condemn? You know what that means? If your heart finds fault with you. How many times does our heart find fault with us? See, that's why the blood is so important. Having your heart sprinkled by the blood of Jesus from an evil conscience. And then your body's washed with the pure water of the word. The reason we don't experience the pure water of the word in our experience is because we haven't allowed our heart to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. We don't proclaim it. We don't declare it. We don't plead the blood. You sprinkle it. What's that, Chris? They took hyssop. Hyssop speaks of your tongue. You sprinkle your heart uh, by the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over my family. The blood of Jesus is my stronghold. Zechariah verse 9. Or chapter 9, I'm sorry. Okay, let's, let's do this quick. Review. Everybody say review. And new. The first thing we talked about, if you're going to grow as a Christian, is to prioritize the Word of God. Seems simple, doesn't it? Prioritize the Word of God. And the second message in this series was called reading the Bible with your Jesus glasses on. In other words, when you look at the Bible, do you see a bunch of laws you have to keep to be right with God? Or do you understand that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness? Romans 10, 4. See, I'm already righteous even when I don't act righteous because I'm born again. And God doesn't say, oh, you missed it. Now I'm rejecting you. That's awesome. I, when I say that, God's good even when you're not, you need to rejoice in that. In Romans chapter 6, Paul said this. He said, should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. If that question never comes up when you're preaching, you're not preaching the same gospel that Paul taught. Some people hear it as, well, you're just giving me license to sin. No, I'm giving you license to be who you are in Christ. But see if that question never comes up because, because God's not holding sin against you. Because he already put it on Jesus at the cross. Some people think that that means it don't matter how you live. That's wrong. This is why I tell people no condemnation is so important. So you keep going to God even if you're struggling with something. And as you keep going to God, eventually you'll get free of it. Parable of the sower. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. You know, a lot of misunderstandings in the body of Christ are because people don't understand that parable. 
And Jesus even said in Mark 4, 13, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand all parables? What, what's the parable? How the kingdom of God works in this life. It works like a seed sown in the heart. But see, so often we pray, <laughs> uh, two weeks and things haven't changed. Must not be God. Well, you'd be a terrible farmer. <laughs> I planted my field. There's nothing coming up. Stupid seeds don't work. <laughs> right? See, if you don't under, see a lot of unbelief, and I wrote this in the outline, is, is predicated on people not understanding that parable. So the first key was the Word of God, and we talked about reading the Word of God with your Jesus glasses on. Realizing it's about His life keeping you, and not a bunch of laws you have to keep to be right with God. That's huge. Huge. We talked about the importance of Scripture. The next thing we talked about was the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's God. Amen? And then we talked about the prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. That was big. We talked about understanding. How important understanding is. Remember what understanding is? Understanding is being able to join things together in your mind. The reason Jesus said in Mark, Matthew 13 verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and he can't put it together in his mind or understand it, Satan's able to steal it out of his heart. That happens every single time. That's why people don't understand a balanced grace and faith message because they hear grace as, well, God's not holding my sins against me and God's not going to judge me for sin because he already did. And so people hear that, and because they can't join it together in their mind, they throw faith to the curb. Or people hear faith, and they think faith is about, man, you got to do this, you got to do this, and they're doing to try to get God to do what he's already done instead of receiving. And so they throw grace to the curb, and guess what happens? It doesn't work. See, if you can't understand these things in your mind, the one I used that I thought was so good was uh, the, Jesus has made unto me wisdom, right? Does that mean I have wisdom? 1 Corinthians 1.30, he's made unto me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He's made unto me wisdom. 1 John 2.20 says, I have an unction, an anointing from the Holy One, and I know all things. Wow, I know everything? No, I don't. <laughs> Not in my head. But in my spirit, because my spirit's one with him, I have an unction and I know all things. So I have wisdom, right? Amen. But then why does James 1, 5 say, if you lack it, let it ask of God and he'll give it to you. That, ble that confused me for years. See, we're from the command camp, right? You just command. You speak to the mountain, which is all biblical. So we don't ask. You know why? Because we don't understand. But here's what I understood. I'm not asking from deficit. I'm asking from surplus. I'm asking for something I already have in the spirit. I already have it. Do you hear me? So now I ask, and it's not asking like, oh God, you got to go to the cross and do this. When you, you receive healing, you're not getting God to, by his stripes you were healed. You're not getting him to do something. You're merely receiving what he's already done. That's the difference. See, but here's my point. If you, can't under, if you don't have that understanding working, Satan will steal the truth right out of your heart every single time. Did you know that? That's why understanding is huge. Huge. Massive. Big time. You know, there's churches teach all kinds of doctrines because they take a verse here and ignore 40 verses here. Because they don't have understanding. I think one of the most dangerous things in the world is the pulpit. I really do. Because if the church is messed up, the world's going to be messed up. And how many people, well, God's in control. How many times have I heard that? You've heard it many times, probably said it. No condemnation. I'm telling you, God is not in control. You have a part to play. Now, there's certain things that are, set, or, that are going to occur, like Jesus is going to physically return. You know, there's certain things that are prophesied. But man, you can make a difference. So I'll say that again. You can make a difference. There. Hallelujah. All right, let's, let's move on. So we talked about how important understanding is. And this is something you need to go for. Go to, can I have Proverbs 2, verse 1? We're going to go through verse 5. If not, I'll pull it up here. Proverbs chapter 2. My son. Now, oh, this is so good. 
<laughs> I love that. My son. Builder of the family name. Are you a son or daughter of God? It's not gender specific. You're a builder of God's family name. If you will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Next verse. So that you incline your ear unto wisdom, the correct application of knowledge, and apply your heart to understanding. I was talking to Ramin last night on the phone, and he just got back from Israel and Greece and Turkey and all over the place. And he was talking about, and I was sharing some things with him out of 2 Chronicles 16 and out of Psalm 19. He goes, man, that's good. He said, we need to go over there and, 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 show, these, and show these rabbis some of this stuff because it all points to Jesus. But a lot of them reject that. And I'm thinking this is, this is what he's talking. So that, you, you're, uh, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply your heart. Everybody say apply my heart. To understanding. I need to know. So do you. Next verse. How many women are kept out of the pulpit because people pull verses out of context? How many people believe that if you've been divorced, your life's over and you can't ever be remarried? Because people have taken verses out of context and hurt people. Remember when I showed you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6? The Bible does not say the letter of the law kills. It says the letter kills. And that letter is translated scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. The scriptures will kill without the revelation of Jesus Christ and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Yea, if you criest after knowledge, sounds pretty intense to me. And you lift up your voice for understanding. Next verse. Sounds intense, doesn't it? It's because it is. If you seek her as silver. Wisdom and, and search for her as for hid treasures. Next verse. Look at this next verse. Then and only then. I'm going to say that again. Then and only then shall you understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. God doesn't hide things from us. He hides them for us. God respects your will and my will. If you don't want him, he'll honor that. Even as a Christian. Isn't that something? He wants to be wanted. The choice is mine. Well, Black Chris, if God wants it done, it'll just happen. That's a lie from Satan himself. He loves that lie. That's why there's so much... You know how they get people to not vote? They put out fake polls. Well, so-and-so already won in Arizona. Did I say that? Did I say that? I did. Let the chips fall. And so people, well, what's the use of voting? It's already over. See, that's what the devil does. Satan's voice sounds like this many times. What's the use? You ever heard that voice? You see what happened Friday? We're winning. I know the fake news ain't telling you, but we're winning. That'll probably get my channel knocked off or whatever. Whatever. But it's the truth. See, you don't see all the good news. There's a ton of good news happening. If you're not waking up, you're dead. Thank you. Then, shall, then and only then shall you understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, and we're going to get into a new one today. Oh, there's so many here. I, can't, I have to skip them for the sake of time. Let me, let, me, let me just do one on understanding here. I talked to you last week about repentance and how you repent, change your mind, and believe the gospel. Let me show you another one pertaining to understanding. Another example of how understanding is so important. Galatians 2.18. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 18. Here's what it says. It says, If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Look at that. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. You know what I thought that meant for a long time? I thought that meant, well, if I go back in the bars and I go back to my old ways uh, before I was a believer and all that kind of stuff, I make myself a transgressor. That is absolutely not what he's talking about. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about if I build the same approach to God based on my own merit, I make myself a transgressor. In other words, if I'm trying to relate to God by keeping all the rules and that's what makes me right with God, I make myself a transgressor because there's only one thing God sees and that's the blood of Jesus. Amen? It's the blood of Jesus. That's what he's talking about. And if you read the context, you see that. 
All right, that's, that's another thing I wanted to share with you pertaining to understanding. Uh, jump down to number two. Being faithfully teachable. Once again, none of these things work unless I stay, stay with, with the Lord. Amen? You can't imagine, like I said, trying to grow something and going out and checking if it's coming up every, every two weeks. It won't work. You got to stick with it. You got to stick with the word of God. That's one thing I've done right. By the grace of God, I give God all the praise. I've always prioritized the scriptures. And I'm telling you, the scriptures are amazing. Can, can I throw one thing at you just for the fun of it? I will anyhow. So just say yeah. <laughs> Do you know, I was studying these Hebrew words. They're so powerful. Do you know every Hebrew word has a three-letter root word? Like Shabbat. Every, you know, and, and that three-letter root word, that when the first two letters of that word are the same, all the other words that have that first two letters will be related. So what I'm saying all that, not to go into that, but I'm saying, you realize how much you can learn? You realize how divinely inspired the scriptures are? I mean, there's no way that 40 different people on three different continents over a 14, 15 year span period of time could have got together and come up with the Bible. The scriptures are astounding. And you see how powerful they are. So anyhow, so, but you got to stick with this. And that's, that's why I call this being faithfully teachable. Many people are not teachable. They're set in their ways and they're not set in God's way, which is Jesus. And it, you don't have to be old. You can be young and be set in your ways. When Heather asked about... Uh, I forget how she said it about teachable. Or was, it wasn't teachable. It was another word that she was used. I think pride. I think it was what it was. My hand's up. <laughs> you know? sometimes Because I, I, I intentionally fight to be teachable. Intentionally. Because if I'm not teachable, God, I'm not reachable to God. God can't, God can't teach me something if I already know it. Okay, let's go to number two. I'm, I'm going to give you some powerful examples here. Faithfully teachable, which receives, this is under number two, correction. Everybody say correction. But well, that was good. Three people said it, I think. All right, Proverbs 4.13. Proverbs 4.13. This is going to be really good, guys. Hang on. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 13. Look at this. It says in Proverbs 4.13, I call Proverbs, what do I call pro Proverbs? Anybody know? Proverbs. Remember school? A noun was a person, place, or thing. A verb is an action. Proverbs are proverbs. How does the righteousness of God conduct himself or herself when they're taking out the garbage? Proverbs, right? <laughs> you know, actions, how we operate in this life. Look what it says. Take fast hold of instruction. Now, the word instruction there in the Hebrew means correction. It means chastening. It means discipline. Take fast hold of it. Let her not go. In other words, don't let go of being teachable or being able to be corrected by the word of God. And he may use other people sometimes. <laughs> See, most people, when you counsel with people, you know what counseling is most of the time, sadly? It's just finding someone who agree with what I already, someone who will take my side and you're a good counselor. So many times counselors are more concerned about what the counselee thinks of them than what they need. That's not good counseling. Take fast hold of instruction. You need, if you're getting a tattoo today, get this and put correction in there. It would be better than instruction. Don't relax your hold upon her. Let her not go. Keep her. Watch this. Correction is your very life. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. See, this is this grow. If you're being corrected, you're growing. If you're not, you're not growing. This is when people get, quote, set in their ways. Now go to number three. Let's talk about teachable. What does it mean to be teachable versus being gullible? Teachableness is cooperating with God's word. If I could have Proverbs 19, 21. Proverbs 19, 21. Let's look at this. It says, There are many plans or devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord shall stand. What, you know what I 
tell people, and I mean this with every fiber of my being, I want God's will. That's it. When it comes down to decisions, I want God's will. That's it. Life is too short to do my own thing, call it God, and then stand before the Lord and say, this is what I had for you, but you had to do it your way. Take fast. There are many plans. That word devices means plans. Other translations say that. In a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. So when you ask people's advice, you want the counsel of the Lord. Amen? Some people ask the wrong people for their advice. I want people that are seeking God and want God's will and have wisdom and have tested some of these things. All right, so look at this. Uh, faithfully teachable, which receives correction. Number three, teachable versus gullibleness. Teachableness is cooperating with God's will. Go to Romans 10, 17. Very familiar verse. How many know there's a difference between the Greek word logos, the word of God is the logos, Jesus is the living logos, the entirety of the word, and then there's the rhema. The rhema is a specific revealed word. Or as Keith Trump says, it's God's, uh, uh, it's, it's a daily revelation of God's word. Right? It's the word revealed. Everybody say word revealed. That's the rhema. Now, we quote this verse all the time, Right? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Am I correct? Do you hear that? How many believe as I'm ministering faith is coming? You're wrong. Faith is only coming if you receive it and meditate on it and God reveals it to you. That's the only way faith comes. An opportunity is coming. This is why people hear and they don't hear. They've been saved a hundred years and can't even tell you anything. They're not hearing the rhema. The rhema is, the, that's what Keith says, it's a fresh application of the eternally written word. Faith comes by hearing the rhema revealed word of God. You're getting an opportunity. That's what, the outlines. I heard somebody say they take the outlines and they look at them and they meditate on them and pray in the Holy Ghost over the outlines and you'll get rhema. And that's where faith comes from. Faith does not come from just hearing a logos. It comes from rhema. That's why when I listen to teaching anymore, I'll be driving. That's why I love to be able to turn it off because they'll say something and I turn it off and I'm just listening. That's why when you hear these messages, they, we say so many things. You can't get it in one setting. You got to hear it. Turn it off and listen. It's hard, Chris, because we know you and that's a problem. God uses me in spite of me, not because of me. All that athletic stuff, it's not true. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing people's broken hearts everywhere. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Faith does not come by hearing the logos. It comes by hearing the rhema. Now, opportunity comes. One more. Well, I'll just give it to you for the sake of time. It's in your outline. Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone or by natural food or sustenance alone, but by every rhema. And the word live means live God's life, a real life, uh, not just exist, but by every revealed word of God that's present tense proceeding out of the mouth of God. That's how we are to live. Amen. Amen. That's a good word, Chris. Thank you. All right. Now go to your outline again. What is gullible? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to give you the definition of gullible. What What definition? My definition, <laughs> and it's a good one because it's biblically based. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 7 is, is a mantra for me, if you will. Because people say stuff all the time. You know that. You're in the life, whether it's on, you know, all this and that about, you know, all kinds of with the, the pandemic and everything that all this stuff, people were saying this and that about everything, right? I don't know, but God does. So here's what I, this is my motto. I consider what people say, and then I let the Lord give me understanding. Do you hear that? Now, look at your outline. What is gullible? Gullible is when you consider what people say, and then do not allow God through his word to give you understanding. In other words, you, you can be manipulated. I, I like to say it like this. Multitudes of Christians are led more by guilt than they are by God. They're guilted into things. 
instead of a relationship with God. It's wrong. So consider what people say, but let the Lord give you understanding. The difference between gullible. Now, next, go to 1 Timothy. We're getting to where we're going. We're talking about being faithfully teachable. It's one thing, being teachable is not just gaining more information and adding it to the information I already have. That gives me an opportunity to be teachable. But if I won't allow God to correct me, I can't be teachable. And multitudes of people fall into this. And they believe it only because their favorite preacher says it or this. You've got to have a relationship with God yourself. That's why I said you can hear the greatest preacher all day. And it's not going to change you unless it becomes a, re a reality to you. And that's through your personal relationship. That's why you need to meditate and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. He will. He will. Going on that run the other day and just locking into those verses was just amazing. The things I was seeing. And it all had to do with asking. And he will show you plainly of the Father. And the Father himself has an emotional attachment to me because of my intimate and prolonged association with him. See, God can only work through covenant and that covenant's his son, Jesus. That's the only way he can work. I witnessed to somebody recently and we were talking about the bad things in the world and they were saying that's the reason they don't believe in God because of the bad things in the world. And that goes back to that false teaching that God's just pulling the puppet strings. And that God could do something, but for some sovereign reason, he chooses not to. That's wrong. God gave the earth to man, Psalm 115, verse 16. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. Literally, he's given us an assignment, and through Adam, we blew it. But guess what? The last Adam got that authority back, and now we're here to make a difference. The only reason God delays his coming is because he's not willing that any perish. He's hoping the church figures it out. Who's been around? Who remembers the book? You kids are going to laugh. 88 reasons why the rapture will occur in 1988. And then when that didn't occur, Edgar Wisenut, who was the author, he was that former NASA guy, had all these numbers. He was a wise nut. And anyhow, he, he revised it to the year 1989 because of the, they miscalculated the year zero. Now, a friend of mine does this. It's so good. He says, how many of you people have been born again since 1988? Let me see your hands. Hold your hand up high. Lots of you. And lots of you know what? You know what that means? That's why Jesus didn't. We weren't raptured in 1988. <laughs> because of people. You see that? He's long-suffering, the Bible says, not willing that any perish should perish, but all should come to repentance. All right. Go to your outline. Go to 1 Peter 1, 18. We're going to talk about being faithfully teachable. We're going to talk about words from God. Psalm 1, or what did I say? 1 uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. I want you to see this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, and I've got to give you an example. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. This is Paul speaking to Timothy, and he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son, uh, thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies. What are prophecies? It's not just foretelling the future. It can be, but it's speaking forth the mind of God which went before on thee, watch this, watch this, that by these revealed words of God to your life, you might as war a good warfare. Now think about that. If somebody gets a prophecy, whether from someone else, or you can get a personal prophecy directly to you. But say you get a, a right on prophecy. Most people think that, well, I got a prophecy about this, and it's automatically going to come to pass. Then why did he say that you might war a good warfare with these prophecies? Because the, the fulfillment of that prophecy is not automatic. God's showing you his desire. But you've got a war with those prophecies. Why? What does that mean? When all the negative things are coming out at you and saying, yeah, right, that ain't true. You take those prophecies and you war with them and you say, no, this is what God says. And you stand on what God says. You're in a war. You see that? So I say that to say that it's not automatic. Any word you get from God is not automatic. You have to cooperate. Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together? Except they're in agreement. Now, go. we're going to talk about cooperating with the word. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, faith is a choice. Go to John 20, verse 24 and 25. This is after Jesus' resurrection. John chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. After his resurrection, you know the story. Thomas wasn't there the first time. 
but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This is, I want you to see one thing. Go to the next verse. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Watch this. Except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into, or uh, see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. What do I want you to see here? Faith is a choice. You see that? Thomas is saying, I, unless I see this, I choose to not believe. Wow. And that's the way it is for us in every situation. You notice back to what I said about a Proverbs 2. Then shall you understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. When you seek it, when you desire it. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You shall find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. He promises he will, you will find him. And this isn't about being perfect. This is about the desire of your heart. It's, it keeps going. Even, when, even through its own personal failures, you just keep looking at the goodness of God. And not the shortness, shortcomings of yourself. But anyhow, that's what I wanted you to see there. Now go back to your outline. Examples of teachableness and lack thereof. Teachableness is allowing yourself to be led of God. That's what goes in your blank. Led of God. The natural tendency in our life is to blame other people. That's the natural human tendency. Remember Adam right away after the fall. Lord, it's that woman you gave me. Not only did he blame Eve, he blamed God because God gave Eve to him. And that's the same the way it is with us today. And taking personal responsibility is not a condemning thing. It's actually an encouraging thing because you can allow yourself to change. Isn't that exciting? I think it is. Now, let's, let's look at this. Everybody say Josiah. And I'm, I'm going to give you an example here. Just because you receive a word revealed from God doesn't guarantee its fulfillment. Let's look at Josiah. Let's go to 2 Kings 20. No, let's go to 1 Kings 13. Can I have 1 Kings 13 verses 1 and 2? 1 Kings chapter 13 and verses 1 and 2. If I could have that. Josiah was a king of Judah. He started his reign when he was eight years old. This is amazing. Look at this. It was prophesied of Josiah. I'm telling you, I'm in love with these books. So hang with me. It says, And behold, there came a man of God out of, of Judah by the word of the Lord and, and uh, word of the Lord unto Bethel. And, and Jeroboam stood by the altar of incense. Now stop. Who was Jeroboam? Jeroboam was, started idolatry in the northern kingdom of Israel. Rehoboam was Solomon's son. And the kingdom of Israel split under Rehoboam's reign. And Jeroboam took the north, the ten tribes to the north, and uh, Rehoboam, God gave him one tribe. Uh, and then the Benjamites joined with them too, ben, the tribe of Benjamin. But the point being, the, all the kings of the north were wicked, every one of them, totally into idolatry, very wicked. And so God prophesies judgment on them. So next verse. And watch this. So this prophet comes to Jeroboam and he prophesies. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David. Josiah by name. This was 310 years before Josiah was born. Prophesied his name. Wow. Wow. Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. He's prophesying that because of your idolatry and your rejection of the Lord, rejection of me, God's saying, he's saying, listen, there's going to rise up Josiah by name. See, we think God is long. So we look at the stuff in the world and we think, oh Lord, they've been saying that he's coming back. Peter talks about that in 2 Peter 3. They'll say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years in man's eyes. God is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to us word the church, not willing that any out there should perish. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 
the heavens will burn. These things are going to happen. See, we think it's so long. 310 years, that's nothing. Who in here is 310 years old? Let me see your hand. <laughs> well, one right here. So we only got one person. Dude, that is some seriously good Geritol. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's good stuff. We're going to... No. Anyhow, so, so my point is what we think is long is nothing. Nothing. All right. Now, go to, let's, let's look at Josiah's life a little bit. Let's look at this when it happened. Go to uh, 2 Kings 22. Ah. Now, oh, well, there's so much to say here. Josiah's father was Amnon, and Manasseh was his uh, uh, grandfather. Both of these guys did evil in the sight of the Lord. So what's the lesson there? Josiah was considered a good king. He was a righteous king. But both his dad and his grandpa gave themselves over to evil. Here's the lesson. Are you ready? You can overcome your upbringing. You don't have to be jerk because your dad didn't throw a ball with you when he was five years old or even because he left. I'm not trying to be insensitive to your pain. I'm telling you, Josiah overcame and so did can you. Thank you. All right, now look at this. He did have some godly influences in his life, but I venture to say you do also. <laughs> Jeremiah began his prophetic activity during the reign of Josiah. Uh, the priest of Yahweh raised and uh, protected Josiah, so he did have some things uh, going for him, but guess what? He had some things against him too. Uh, go to, boy, I'm going to read these. Can I go to 2 Kings 22 verse 1? Yeah, oh, five minutes. No, I, I can't read all these. But you, I'm just going to tell you for the sake of time, Josiah executed the judgment that was prophesied in 1 Kings 13. He did his job. Okay? That's awesome, right? Now, now go to verse 22, or verse 18 of 2 Kings 22. Verse 18. Huldah the prophetess prophesied Josiah's peaceful death. Hulda, H-U-L-D-A-H, prophesied Josiah's peaceful death because he was zealous to exercise the will of God. So, but to the king of Judah, that would be Josiah, which sent you to inquire the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, next verse, because thine heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest that I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof that they should become a desolation and a curse. So you rent thy clothes, which is an act of humility and repentance, and wept before me. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. One more verse. We're getting that. Before, behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers and you shall be gathered into thy grave in peace. This was a prophecy. I'm going to show you that it did not come to pass. <gasps> wow. Wonder why. And thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Well, let's see what happened. And then you get in the 2 Kings, uh, the next chapter, 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. And, it, and in verses 1 through 25, it talks about him exercising all this judgment. It's really powerful. But look at verse 28. 2 Kings 23 and verse 28. So Hulda prophesies that Josiah will come to his grave in peace. But what happened? Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, this is 23 through 30, or excuse me, 28 through 30. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Next verse. In his days, Pharaoh Necro, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. And he, Pharaoh Necro, the king of Egypt, slew Josiah at Megiddo when he had seen him. Sounds like he died in battle to me. Next verse. Boy, we got a contradiction. What are we going to do with this? You'll see. And his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher. And the people of the land took Jehoiahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's steed. Now why, when she prophesied that he would die in peace, did he die in battle? Why? Do you know the scripture answers it? And do you know there's a lesson in there for us? That lesson is, even though I have a word from God, 
It doesn't mean it's going to be fulfilled if I don't cooperate. Josiah did not cooperate with that word that Huda prophesied. Let me show it to you. Go to 2 Chronicles 35. 2 Chronicles 35. And look at verse 20 through 27. 2 Chronicles 25. If you don't have it, I got it. Uh, 2 Chronicles 35, I'm sorry. 35 verses 20 through 27. Watch this. <clears throat> 20 through 27 of 2 Chronicles 35. I'll find it here. Here we go. After all this, there it is. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necro, Pharaoh Necro, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. Hmm. Go to the next verse. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, Pharaoh Necro sent ambassadors to Josiah, the king of Judah, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day. I'm not, I'm not fighting against you, but I'm coming against the house wherewith I have war. For God hath commanded me to make haste. God had commanded Pharaoh Necro to make haste. Forbear therefore from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. In other words, Josiah, you're, you're sticking your nose in the wrong business. Next verse. This is so good. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him. He was set in his ways. But disguised himself that he might fight with him and hearken not unto the words of Necro, Pharaoh Necro, from the mouth of God. The words that Pharaoh Necro spoke to Josiah trying to get him to back away were words from God. You see that? But came to fight him, with him in the valley of Megiddo. Next verse. And the archer shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. Next verse. The servants therefore took him out of the, that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchers of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Next verse. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah and all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah in their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. Behold, they are written in the lamentations. Two more verses. Next verse. Now the rest of the, the acts of Josiah and his goodness according to that which was written in the law of the Lord. Next verse. And his deeds, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Here's the point. There was a legitimate word that Huda the prophetess told Josiah that you would die in peace. But it did not happen because Josiah did it his own way. That's the same with you and I. We, that's why he said by the prophecies, the prophecies from the word of God, not just somebody calling you out, but I'm saying prophecies that God shows you, the rhema words that he has shown you, that by them you might war a good warfare. Well, I'm just going to do it my way. The only way God can direct you in all your paths is if you acknowledge him in all your paths. Amen. Amen. Praise God. But that's what happened. Josiah refused to listen to the word from God. He got involved in a battle that he should not have been in and it destroyed him. How many people are destroyed because they get a word that you're going to marry this person and it's not a word from God? How many people are destroyed because they get a word? I, I know people that God's telling me to tell you you're called to do this and called to do that. Listen, you don't tell people what they're called to do. Amen. Whew. Praise God. Some prophecies are established and others require personal cooperation. Godly discernment must accompany teachableness or gullibleness will result. Gullibleness, gullibleness will result. Now look at this. In 1 Kings 13, let me tell you about the prophet there. It's in, your, it's in your verses here. Verses 7 through 18. You know the, the prophet in 1 Kings that spoke Josiah's name? That spoke Josiah's name, right? Remember that? He spoke his name, prophesied his name. That's amazing. Do you know that prophet was destroyed and lost his life? Do you know why? Because he had a word from God that says, don't stop at anybody's house, make a straight beeline, go home, etc., etc. And another guy went out and said, he was a prophet too. And he said, God told, you to, told me to tell you to come to my house. And then he sat there and he said, you've disobeyed the Lord. And he ended up getting killed by a lion. I believe it was a lion. Because, once again, 
somebody come out and said, I'm a prophet too. I'm going to give you another example. You remember when Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and, and Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Some say you're Elijah, some say you're this, some say you're that. But who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. Now watch this. But right after that, Read it in Matthew 16. Right after that, Jesus started telling what was going to happen with his crucifixion. And then and, and Peter comes up to him, the same guy, the same guy, mind you, that had just said this amazing word from God that God revealed to him. The same guy comes up to Jesus and says, not so, Lord, this will not be. And Jesus looks at him and says, get thee behind me. Satan, called him Satan. And that's a pretty big jump from blessed art by thou barge. Jonah to Satan, man, I was doing good. <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. Because you savor us or you're the things that are not of God, but the things that are of men. Now, Jesus was tempted or tested in all points like you and, I, you and I are. It had to be a test for Jesus. This guy just hit the money, hit the nail on the head. And now he's prophesying something that's totally contrary to the will of God. See, this is why you need to be led. This is why you need to be faithfully teachable. Everybody say faithfully teachable. I mean, if you hear a word that you don't like, don't get mad. Man, I can show you examples. I'm thinking of King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles 26. Remember that? He started, he was, the Bible says, as long as he sought the Lord, he prospered. He went forward. But then his heart was lifted up. He started thinking, man, ain't I something? And the Bible says he went into the temple and he started, he got out of his, his kingly role and got into a priestly role and leprosy rose up. 80 priests, four score priests go in and try to talk sense to him. He gets mad. Asa in 2 Chronicles 16, they get, they get a word and they get mad. Why would you get mad? Consider what's being said, but just let the Lord give you understanding. Once you get mad, you shut down any teachableness. I'll say that again. You, you put a wall up. A brother offended. It's harder to be one than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Proverbs 18, 19. Whenever that happens, you stop the teachableness of God every time. I'll tell you what. I may not be perfect in many ways, but by the grace of God, I strive to be teachable and to be correctable by the word of God. If you can show me in the word of God, I will change. But if you show me someone's opinion and it's not validated by the word of God and it's the wrong spirit, I'm throwing it where it belongs. That would be in the garbage can. Amen. Amen? Amen. But it doesn't come naturally. I find at times I'm, I'm stuff and I want to blame someone else. Well, this person or that person. Anybody else been there? And I say, no, it's, it's not what they're doing or not doing that's making me react this way. It's my choice. No one can rent space in your brain without your consent or cooperation. It's your choice. People get mad. Oh, that preacher said something. You know, I talk about tongues. We've had people walk out before. Read the Bible. What's the Bible say? Don't take my opinion for it. Study the word. We don't believe it like that. I just don't believe it like that. What does God say? Ah, could go on and on. So that's key number three, being faithfully teachable. There's another powerful key. All these things require faithfulness. So many people blow in, blow up, and blow out because they don't. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those that are planted, Psalm 92. Those that are planted, they, they shall flourish. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They'll be full of spiritual vitality, the Amplified says, and, and, and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. But the key is to stay planted. Amen? Amen. The word of God with your Jesus glasses on, number one. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, number two. Being faithfully teachable. In other words, when God shows me something, if you're not... Uh, repenting on a consistent basis, then you're not believing the gospel on a consistent basis because I'm always getting corrected in my understanding. That's a good thing. He's always tweaking me. It's called growth. You've heard the story, and I'll close with this. You heard the story about when they launched the, the rocket to the moon, right? And you think this precision technology, and they press the button, and it would just land right there. But it was actually course correction, like, what, every 10 minutes? They just kind of flung it in that direction and there was course corrections. And then when they landed, they were only like five yards or so from being outside of a, like a 500 mile landing place. <laughs> That's how our Christian walk is. We got to constantly make course corrections with the word of God. We have to constantly seek it. And, and, it, and it never ends. 
See, this is why you can't live on feelings. Oh, but I hit a nail there. Feelings follow. Listen, if you're, led by your, if you're led by faith, your feelings will follow. If you're led by your feelings, your faith will be hollow. Remember that. That's a powerful line. Amen? I love good feelings, but sometimes things don't always want, my feelings don't always want to agree with what I want. I want them to be. Amen? Well, I'm married now, and so I just expect to feel a good every day, feeling this and feeling that. Well, you've probably been married, what, a day? <laughs> and I'm just being real. The only fulfillment that you and I will ever find is in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the only consistent thing. And I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it again. You say, Chris, you're hanging on because this is a word from God. Praying in the Holy Ghost. You say, oh, Chris, we've heard you say that for years. And guess what? I'm still here. There's a reason. If you think I can be this excited with all the garbage I've been through after all these years without the ministry of the Holy Ghost and praying in private tongues, you're insane. Oh, maybe I should be nicer. Um, you're, you're, all, you're misguided in that area. <laughs> it takes a consistent lifestyle staying built up. If you're not built up, you're run down. And many Christians don't even know the difference. So we live run down and we don't even know why. So you make it a part of your regimen. I'm going to pray and flesh. You're going to sit there and shut your mouth. You're going to meditate in the word of God while I pray. It's not... God loves you if you never pray. He does. He, you're, not, you're not any more saved if you pray. But you need to know the things that are freely given to you. Amen. The blood was the purchase price. The name of Jesus is the receipt. And praying in the Spirit is, allows the Holy Spirit to reveal what's been purchased by the blood. Every redemptive blessing that Jesus has purchased has been by His precious blood. Amen. So, through the prophecies, the revealed word of God, the rhema words of God, guess what? We're going to war good warfare in Jesus' name. Praise God. Hallelujah. The word of God is so good. I mean, it is just, I'm astounded. I'm going to give you a, this is a, you know how they do with the movies and they say, coming soon. <laughs> you know, they do that. I, I've been, I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone the other day. And I was talking about, I'm just so pumped about 1 John 5. And 1 John 5 says, uh, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And uh, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Then it goes into this big dissertation. This is he that came by water and blood. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it's the Spirit that bears witness, for the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are. When there's three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. What is that talking about? You want to know? I'm going to give you a hint. It's all about Jesus. But it's not just... A, listen, what is the water and the blood? What is the water and the blood? It's really big. I mean, it's big, big. I'm thinking, oh my word, you put this in here for me, Lord. Once again, understanding, we build our house, that, that builds the house is our understanding, the house of wisdom. But see, what we, what we don't understand is Satan's able to lose it. How many verses have I went over, skimmed over for years, and still do, I'm sure, but I'm trying not to because I did not understand why they were in there. Like I told you something the other day I never saw before. Do you know that Satan destroyed the animals that Job had? So Job didn't have any animals to sacrifice. In other words, no bloodshed. That was the first thing Satan went for. <laughs> What does he go for with you and I? Oh, just, just have worship and all that stuff, but don't get into that blood stuff. Just, just keep that blood stuff out. Amen? He's a, see, anywhere you cut the Bible, it's going to bleed. You know that. All right, I better stop. I don't know how to stop. If I get to the prayer team up here, that'd be great. Are you blessed? You really are blessed. Really blessed. Kept one more Altoid thinking, you need to thank God for that. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> if you need prayer for anything, first of all, I don't want to assume everybody's born again. You must be born again. The Bible says you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again uh, in John chapter 3. But, but I want to encourage you to accept Jesus. 
The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I'm not against the sinner's prayer, as we call it. But sometimes I think, and this is me thinking, uh, basically is you just call on the Lord. Confess him. The Bible says if you confess him, Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. In other words, the redemptive work, you shall be saved. Romans 10, 9, right? So I'm going to encourage you, if you're not born again, call upon the Lord. Look at those verses in, in John, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Uh, sometimes I, what I say, I, I think about, it's like if somebody cheated on their spouse, I say, okay, now sit down. Now, Sally, tell Fred, say, dear Sally, say, or dear Fred, repeat after me. Say it, say it. <laughs> you know, I think it's got to be a thing of the heart. I know it does. Nothing wrong with the sinner's prayer, but it's got to be a thing of the heart. Because the heart you believe in the righteousness, and then confession is made unto salvation. So anyhow, these, I don't want to assume that you're born again. That's real important. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. We talk about it a lot. We will continue to talk about it a lot. The reason we have human religion, let me tell you, is because people interpret the Bible with their gray matter rather than the, menace, the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not just praying in private tongues. That's a big part of it. It's not the only thing. You got to be teachable and you got to stick with the word. You got to be willing to be wrong. I didn't say that in the message. I should have said that. Are you willing to be wrong? Well, as long as it doesn't take me out of... See, sometimes people want only in their little sphere. But what if I'm way off here? I've, I have had to adjust things many times that I believe that were incorrect according to the scriptures. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the, for the word of God and the, the Holy Spirit? And then and, and being teachable. And we got one more major key and we're going to encompass the... In, oh, I'm not Wrap it around with being faithful in Jesus' name and being consistent. So if you need prayer for anything, if you need prayer for healing, the Bible says by his stripes we were healed. We were healed. I want to pray for my wife who's dealing with sinitis or whatever it is. I curse that in Jesus' name. And I want to say this to you too because God's been showing me this. A lot of times healing has to take place at a heart level. Many times, the Bible says he restores my soul in, in uh, Psalm 23. In other words, a lot of times we, we deal, the sickness is just a symptom of a heart that needs healed. Amen? So I pray that for everyone that we pray healing for, Lord, that, that not we attack the sickness, we attack the infirmity, but Lord, we, the condition of the heart, Lord, I pray for healed hearts. Lord, hearts that don't condemn us. The Bible says if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence towards God. And Lord, I thank you that our hearts are sprinkled. We sprinkle our, I sprinkle right now the hearts of everyone that we pray for with the blood of Jesus so that the pure water of God's word can wash over their physical situation. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we got a book we want to give you. We're just about out. If you want us to order them, Okay, we got, yeah, we got to just cut. Well, those are phenomenal books. We have a book that we like to give you and encourage you in that. And if you pray in the Spirit, keep doing it. And if you don't, I encourage you to get it. If you don't, we love you whether you don't. That's okay. It doesn't matter. I'm just telling you the truth. And if you can show me from the Bible where it's not the truth, I'll change. But you can't. How do you know? Been there, done that. Still go there. Go there all the time. I have the major study Bibles of the people that come against us. They're smoking dope. They have to be. Because you can't get that interpretation without some assistance. I'm serious. I, think, I can't even believe they say those things. And these are smart people. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting too crisp now. <laughs> That's what I love about President Trump. He's just who he is. <laughs> you know, just be real. Amen. Praise God. You're blessed. Amen. Give the Lord a hand, yeah. Amen. <laughs>